I want to uh, welcome you all to, again to the uh, 10th uh, International Space Medicine Summit. We're very pleased to have you all here this morning. And uh, our welcoming uh, remarks will be made by Ambassador Derision. Ambassador Derision uh, served as the Assistant Secretary of State for uh, Middle Eastern Affairs and also as Ambassador to Israel, Ambassador to Syria, and had a very long and distinguished career in the American, uh, in the U.S. Foreign Service. So uh, let me uh, introduce uh, Ambassador Derision. Good morning, everybody. George mentioned I was ambassador to Israel and Syria, and the real reason is because when they appointed me, they looked at my medical records in the State Department and found out I was the only schizophrenic. So, <laughs> so they sent me to both Syria and Israel. Well, I want to give you a very uh, warm good morning uh, to Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to all the attendees to this year's summit. It's remarkable, this is our 10th anniversary. This is the 10th uh, International Space Medicine Summit we've hosted here at the Baker Institute. And we're very happy to be partnering this year with uh, Texas A&M University, Boeing, and the Baylor College of Medicine. I want to specifically cite George Abbey, our Baker Institute Fellow on Space Policy, who's been at my side for many years here. He's done a really outstanding job of uh, moving our space policy program uh, forward uh, uh, to a remar remarkable level. I particularly want to welcome this morning our many distinguished guests visiting from Russia, China, uh, Europe, and Japan, and all the other nations joining us for the summit. I'd like also to especially welcome a few other individuals here today. Charlie Bolden, who's hiding in the back. <laughs> a close friend of the summit, and as you all know, the administrator of the United States National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Uh, Dava Newman, the deputy uh, administrator of NASA. Where are you, Dava? Are you here? Sure. Back in DC meeting. Oh, back in DC. Oh, okay. And Dr. Demetrius Lagudas, Senior Associate Dean for Research, and Professor Bonnie Dunbar from Texas A&M. I would also like to recognize Dr. Bobby Alford, formerly of uh, Baylor College of Medicine and one of the founders of the summit. And uh, Bobby and uh, George have worked very closely together over the years. He's recently retired from Baylor and after a long and very distinguished career. If the summit has been successful, it is no small way due to his personal dedication and, and vision. So at this year's summit, we're celebrating our 50th anniversary of the Gemini program, which was the forerunner of the Apollo program. I want to give a special welcome to Tom Stafford, if he's here. Is Tom here? Welcome back, Tom. <laughs> Good to see you. Who is an essential part of the Gemini program and who joins us here today. This is a timely event. Only a few weeks ago, President Obama announced his goal of a mission to Mars by the 2030s. Uh, this is a daunting task, as we all know, and I'm certain the challenges of accomplishing this feat will be discussed at length during this summit. These are important discussions. But what we know it will take if this mission is to be accomplished is international cooperation. Can't do it on our own. Space is a field which time and time again has proven the crucial importance of cooperation and coordination. The International Space Station would not be flying today were it not, for example, for our Russian partners. And the partnership of the two countries in space, along with our other international partners on the International Space Station, has become the model for how nations can work uh, together to achieve a common goal that benefits all. Uh, building international connections and communications are central to the aims of the Space Medicine Summit. I only wish on a political front we had half the cooperation we do as we do the space front. I'm also pleased that the summit continues to emphasize the importance of education. Young scientists and engineers with new and innovative ideas and approaches are going to be needed to ensure a healthy future for space exploration. We're doing our little bit on this. For the past six years, the Baker Institute has sponsored a student exchange program with the Bauman Moscow State Technical University in Moscow, sending American University students to Bauman and welcoming Russian students here uh, to Texas. 
it has become a very meaningful experience for the participants who are left with a, a deeper understanding of space policy and the value of international cooperation in space. So let me conclude. The road to the human exploration of space begins with the International Space Station and the understanding and the effects of long duration space flight on the human body. Your deliberations here at the International Space Medicine Summit impact the future of space travel and will have a meaningful impact here on Earth. I wish you very every success in your proceedings over the next three days and welcome again. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, I think uh, you all have programs that I think are uh, pretty well uh, tell the schedule for activities. And I think for those of you that are staying at the uh, Marriott, there is transportation over to the Baker Institute each day. And uh, we will uh, have that in the evenings as well. Uh, so if you have any questions or, in, or any uh, problems at all, there is a staff here that is ready to answer those questions. So feel uh, free to go ahead and ask any if there's any issues at all. And uh, Jeff Sutton, is Jeff here? Jeff is my colleague uh, in this program. Let me uh, turn it over to Jeff for a minute. Uh, well, good morning, and thank you very much, Mr. Abbey. Thank you, Ambassador Dridgen, for your eloquent remarks. Uh, on behalf of Baylor College of Medicine and in the tradition of uh, Dr. Bobby Elford, uh, who as uh, the ambassador has uh, recognized as co-hosting uh, these wonderful summits over the uh, many years since their inception, uh, I wanted to, uh, to welcome you uh, to this uh, ISMS 2016. Um, as uh, stated, the summits really offer a unique opportunity to candidly share experiences and to uh, discuss uh, really pertinent and important issues uh, at the frontier of international collaboration uh, and uh, at the frontier of uh, human space exploration. So thank you for participating, and uh, I'm sure that we'll all have a very informative and productive uh, and wonderful meeting. So thank you, George. Uh, this morning, we're very fortunate to uh, have a, a speaker that's going to give the uh, opening address. Uh, he's an individual that has flown in space. He's an astronaut with the European Space Agency. Uh, he uh, went into the German Air Force after he graduated and uh, received his degree in aerospace engineering and uh, became a pilot in the German Air Force and went on to the Empire Test School at Bascombe Downs in England and uh, uh, graduated as a test pilot. In uh, 1992, he was selected uh, as an astronaut in Europe. And uh, in 1995, he flew the Euromir 95 mission on TM-22, the uh, Soyuz mission up to uh, the Mir space station and spent uh, 179 days in space. Uh, that wasn't enough for our, our speaker, Tom uh, Thomas Ryder. He uh, came back and went up again on Discovery to the International Space Station for a six-month stay. Uh, he has 350 days in space, and uh, he, uh, when he came back, he uh, went to work for ESA, and uh, he's a general in the, in the German Air Force. Uh, but he uh, became the director of the Directorate for Human Spaceflight and Operations in ESA, and, uh, and just recently has become uh, ESA's international coordinator and advisor to the Director General. So let me turn it over to Thomas Ryder. Thank you very much, Mr. Abbey, for this introduction. Dear Ambassador, dear President Sutton, dear Mr. Bolden, dear Charlie, distinguished guests, dear colleagues, dear friends, it's a great pleasure for me to be here today uh, on behalf of uh, my Director General, uh, Professor Werner, and to talk a little bit about exploration. I've been asked to focus a little bit more on the aspect of our next um, uh, 
uh, Trabant uh, next uh, celestial body, uh, the moon. And um, before I uh, come a little bit more into the detail, let me start with a kind of historical view um, a few uh, years back, um, I found a very beautiful picture which is taken out of a book of a French astronomer uh, called Camille Flammarion. He wrote a book um, about astronomy for the people end of the last uh, of the 19th century. And um, I think this picture very beautifully shows that humans are longing to reveal the secrets of the universe and to explore what's behind this outer sphere, which they call primum mobile at this time. And it shows very well uh, the path that has started at these uh, uh, times and that we are pursuing. Uh, less than 100 years uh, later, I would say a little bit more than half a century later, uh, we have uh, these beautiful views from um, the Earth orbit. Uh, humans have uh, been on the surface of the moon. And I think um, this is uh, an excellent opportunity today here to discuss a little bit what can be the next steps and the future plans in a very international context. I would like to uh, give a short overview in the next uh, minutes about uh, the uh, exploration strategy of ESA, which is of course not derived just in a, in a closed room all by ourselves. It's uh, on the basis of very intensive discussions in the frame of the International Space Exploration Coordination Group, exchange of course with our partners of the ISS program, and um, it has been actually um, um, supported by our member states in uh, the last ministerial conference in 2014. So a few words about this exploration strategy. Then um, from, this, uh, technology, from uh, um, the activities that ESA is going to uh, have in the area of lunar exploration. And uh, last point, of course, uh, we need to very carefully consider how we are preparing these steps from technology roadmap to development priorities. So um, starting with the um, ESA exploration strategy, um, I already gave some, some uh, context in which that was developed. Um, we had a quite intensive iterative process with our 22 member states in the last three years, I can say. Um, it ended in this um, document, which is called Exploration Strategy and uh, was supported by a declaration in the last ministerial conference, which um, gives our director general the task to make proposals in uh, the direction of exploration. It's based on the three destinations, low Earth orbit, moon, and of course, Mars. It is mission focused. Um, I'm um, emphasizing that because um, it should make clear that we are not um, putting a capability-based approach in the uh, front, but really a mission-focused um, approach in front. It is clearly enabled through global cooperation um, and certainly the partnership um, uh, of the International Space Station program is an excellent basis for uh, this. Implemented through international missions and long-term strategic partnerships and tailored to answer the benefits of society at large. Now, the last point I think is uh, a very, very important one. Um, we all know that uh, um, the uh, public is uh, quite interested in events. Uh, very recently, um, we had a, a mission to um, ExoMars approaching our near um, uh, partner planet uh, Mars. Uh, Rosetta mission, which uh, caught a lot of attention. But um, once this initial excitement um, is, is over, always the question comes, well, why are we doing that? And in this um, context, our director general um, organized a um, dialogue with the uh, public so-called citizens debate uh, beginning of September in all 22 member states. In total, about 2,000 citizens participated, so roughly about 100 per ESA member states. They were selected not to be, let's say, the usual suspects, which anyhow um, are in favor of uh, space flight and exploration, but really to have um, <clears throat> as good as possible broad view 
of uh, uh, space um, across all um, age regimes and um, across a wide range of uh, professions. And the results you see here are quite encouraging. There is a, a strong trust in space agencies in general. Certainly in uh, Europe, uh, NASA is, is very well known. Um, we are still competing <laughs> with ESA. Uh, if you ask citizens on the street about uh, uh, name a space agency, I, I think um, every second, if not more, would, would Im immediately come up with NASA. So that uh, gives a kind of uh, insight. Um, and there is a, a good trust also in the European Space Agency. Very good uh, coherence in the understanding that space is a common good for humanity. And I don't want to read all the bullets here, but I think especially the last bullet is, has been quite surprising for us, that uh, people who are now not involved on a daily basis in space um, overall think it's quite uh, natural to exploit natural resources from space. We did not expect that. Um, there is still uh, in-depth analysis ongoing of this public debate. And you can imagine we are quite curious what will be now the exact outcome. But once again, these first points are quite encouraging. And um, in this way, I would like now to um, come to the question, what does this mean for our activities in exploration in general and specifically for lunar exploration? The moon for us is uh, quite an important um, destination. It gives uh, inf insight into the history of the solar system, a cosmic context of our understanding for life on Earth. Um, I think the uh, still valid theory is that uh, the moon has been uh, created by an impact of an asteroid of the early Earth. And um, in that way, this uh, state is frozen and can give a lot of insight into the development, not only of the moon, but also of our own planet, the Earth. Um, it is an area for resource assessment and exploitation, a platform for further exploration missions, astronomy, and planetary protection. I have to admit, when I was flying over on, um, on uh, Wednesday um, in the airplane, I, I was just watching one of these uh, newer science fiction movies, which picked up this idea of planetary protection from the moon. So I think there are good reasons to um, keep the moon in the focus as our closest um, celestial body. And um, we have at the time uh, basically three corporations which we are um, envisaging. First of all with Roscosmos on lunar robotic missions and I will come a little bit um, later in uh, with some more details. Cooperation with NASA on human transportation, the um, service module for the Orion spacecraft. And of course, as uh, it is very strongly um, uh, progressing here in the United States, we are trying to intensify also in Europe the um, uh, cooperation with the private sector on establishing lunar exploration related services. Now, um, for the cooperation with Russia, we are um, looking for um, uh, certain technologies that had been developed in the past years. There was a lunar lander program um, uh, at the beginning of this decade, uh, we put it on the table of our ministerial conference. Um, at uh, this time, it was uh, probably a little bit too early. It did not go through as a, as a full program. We were looking for this kind of cooperation now with our Russian colleagues and uh, two key technologies we are now introducing into this, um, in the, in, in this uh, cooperation, which is basically um, uh, technology related to precise navigation and obstacle avoidance during landing and uh, a prospect which is uh, drilling and sample uh, retrieval and analysis um, on orbit, uh, on, on the surface of the moon. This is uh, the next step. These proposals are currently on the table for our upcoming ministerial conference. And of course, there is a perspective to build upon this development um, in the uh, coming years, then in the beginning of the next decade, um, which could be an important step towards returning um, humans to the moon. 
Um, also, in the cooperation with NASA, we are um, working um, towards this uh, um, service module for the uh, uh, Orion spacecraft. Um, this is uh, in a good state. We just recently um, completed the Delta CDR. I think that this uh, cooperation is on excellent track. You see we have also other components, little components that are very suitable for supporting such international um, um, activities in uh, Earth orbit, in deep space, like uh, international berthing and docking mechanism, uh, which is compatible with a standard that um, we all have been working together on in uh, the past years. Um, in uh, end of March, uh, we have been um, uh, preparing a, a website where uh, we are trying to, to attract not only um, our um, uh, engineers and, and uh, scientists, but also the general uh, public uh, for all moon-related topics. If you uh, find the time, I can only invite you to take a, a look at this, um, at this website. I think it um, very nicely combines all um, aspects aspects of uh, our neighboring celestial body in this way and um, hopefully can uh, support also an increasing interest in uh, uh, this endeavor. Now um, with uh, our new DG taking over his function in uh, uh, July last year, he came up with this idea of uh, um, Lunar Village. Uh, it is uh, rather um, a concept than a program. And uh, this um, has been discussed now in various occasions in the um, IAC and other opportunities. And the idea behind it is indeed, as I already mentioned in the context of the ISS program, that based on uh, this cooperation, um, there could be an extended um, level of uh, uh, international partners that um, uh, could uh, contribute to uh, such uh, um, creation of a base, permanent base on our neighboring uh, celestial body. Come to the third point. Um, now, this is all ambitions and intentions that we have. And uh, in which way can we support this um, uh, developments? And that uh, is from technology roadmap to development priorities. In ESA, we have uh, a wide spectrum of uh, all kinds of uh, activities in developing certain technologies for all areas of space flight. And obviously, it is very difficult to um, bring them all up uh, at a higher TRL techn technology readiness level at the same time. So in the last uh, years, we um, were going through a very intense exercise to, first of all, identify exactly those uh, technologies and then uh, to um, make a kind of prioritization. You see here, first edition of this uh, technology roadmap uh, was issued already in 2012. Second edition was issued um, end of last year. And based on this um, um, activities, we have now been going together with our member states through a kind of prioritization process um, uh, beginning of this year. Out of about uh, 32 proposals that you see here, we have uh, prioritized 10 in the area of life support technologies, radiation monitoring, surface EVA, and so forth. And um, this is um, the basis also now for our program proposal that is on the table for the upcoming ministerial. I just would like to give you some examples out of that, which are quite concrete and in preparation for uh, being uh, delivered and tested on board the International Space Station, like an advanced closed loop uh, uh, life support system, ACLS, analysis uh, systems for the atmosphere on board the station. MELISA is a, um, an advanced uh, project for a microecological life support system, alternative, more or less a biological um, ECLIS system, and also on uh, um, the robotic side, uh, some activities that are related to human robotic uh, partnership. Now, uh, um, as a last point, and uh, as uh, ISMS is called in another space, um, medical symposium, I would like also to take some reference 
to um, some aspects that have been discussed um, in the context of this international exploration capability studies with the international partners. You see here a list that is um, out of this um, uh, combined uh, study with uh, some uh, challenges related also uh, to um, human health and performance research, an area where um, our uh, scientists together uh, with uh, their international partners are uh, doing their work. Uh, for example, in the area of uh, immune system, microbiome, um, crew habitation. And I would like at the end to pick out uh, one interesting aspect, which um, I think is, uh, has quite some potential for the future, where we have built a topical team um, in, uh, in Europe and working towards it. Um, reminds me a little bit on one of my favorite um, uh, science fiction movies, uh, Odyssey in Space. Um, and uh, it's related to hibernation, or the uh, more uh, technical term is topor, <laughs> which indeed can be a game changer for uh, the future um, of uh, long-term space flight if we think about the mission durations that uh, would be ahead of us if we are uh, leaving low Earth orbit, if we are um, even going beyond moon, um, um, which uh, could be quite important. Um, this uh, topor, as it's called, uh, has uh, significant advantages. Uh, no psychostress, no degradation of bone and muscles uh, for the brain function. There is a loss of uh, synaptic contacts that can be observed, but they are usually repaired during the arousal. Um, radiation effects in this uh, um, uh, state are uh, minimized, and of course, it has quite some impacts for logistics. Now, um, this hibernation and topor um, has uh, uh, some uh, very interesting aspects. Uh, this picture you see here is a, is a dormouse, and these uh, animals are indeed able to go into this um, hypermetabolic state. It's widely spread in mammals. Um, it's to date uh, clear that there are no unique factors or genes identified uh, for this state. So there is um, an indication that this could be probably um, um, potential that also humans could translate into this um, hypermetabolic -meta state. We have uh, created already three years ago a topical team uh, led by uh, two uh, German scientists. And I know there is uh, quite a broad international um, participation in this team. And um, uh, apart from the um, interesting um, aspect that this could uh, bring for um, extended uh, space flight, uh, going on extended missions to, um, into our uh, solar systems, it has quite some uh, um, benefits for uh, the uh, people here on Earth. Um, it could lead to an extended knowledge about the modulation of metabolic processes, facilitate extended surgery and intensive care, organ transplantation, a new method of anesthesia, increase resistance against radiation damage, improve effects of shock, and suppress immune inflammatory responses. So um, I was choosing that because I think um, across all these uh, topics we are discussing in order to prepare um, longer um, stay uh, capability to stay for a longer time in this environment of space. Um, this has quite some uh, interesting aspects. And that brings me uh, to the end um, of my um, uh, presentation. Um, just two weeks ago, our director general signed together with the European Union policy on, uh, on, on space. It is uh, a very interesting document basically focusing on industrial policy. I'm afraid it does not really focus on, um, on uh, aspects specifically on exploration. It focuses on benefits for the um, societies here on Earth. But I think um, that uh, despite all these um, things you have been for sure following in the European Union, uh, Brexit and others, uh, we can um, today say that uh, the European Space Agency, with uh, its uh, mechanisms, which, uh, with its uh, form of governance, is quite um, um, independent of that. It has the full support of um, our member states. And um, UK, by the way, um, is discussing Brexit. 
is not thinking about leaving ESA. So that uh, brings me to this uh, last slide where um, our director general was saying, well, United States of Europe is uh, probably uh, a dream. Who knows if it will become true, but at least um, based on all this um, expertise, on the experience we have done, on the collaborations we have in the past with our international partners, we at least are on a good way to create a united space in Europe. So thank you very much for your attention. Yes, indeed. Um, for um, all these um, aspects that I have mentioned here, um, there are concrete pro proposals on the table, um, which will be now discussed in the upcoming ministerial conference in uh, 2000, in, in, in December this year. Um, the lunar activities that I have been talking about, we are in a phase B, so we have already um, made a big step forward. So we are basically waiting for the financing for entering into phase CD. Uh, the technology examples I gave you, they are um, already in a phase CD. ACLS will be delivered to ISS uh, next year. Um, the other um, instruments are in uh, phase C, so it's, it's progressing. Um, we have uh, also made quite um, a significant, um, uh, let's say, step in the programmatic planning. A lot of ESA's programs which are related to human and robotic exploration have been separate, They're even separate in different directorates. Now with our new DG, this is combined in one directorate and it is put together in a framework program. So this gives a little bit higher flexibility, programmatic flexibility. Of course, you, uh, you, you have to, um, to struggle with uh, the case that in, 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 in the, let's say in the case you don't get the full funding, you need to shift money from one activity to the other and see how you combine it. So it's flexibility, but there is of course also risk to it. There is uh, funding to it. And um, in uh, uh, end of, uh, well, actually, uh, the ministerial is first and second of uh, December. So on the third of December, we will know a little bit more. Thank you. This will be a major topic at your ministerial meeting in December? Yes, yes. Can I, uh, can I ask a question? Um, uh, thank you for that talk. I, I'm interested in this reference to uh, Space Odyssey and putting humans in shallow torpor or, and, and uh, mm -hmm. it's an issue that comes up and then disappears and comes back up. And uh, we, uh, in the um, uh, IBMP's 520 day mission, we saw measured uh, by uh, measuring body movement uh, that there is a behavioral torpor that develops where crew members moved less awake when they were awake and less when they were asleep, astonishingly. <laughs> and we think that's some characteristic of the environment. We didn't have core body temperature measures to know if there was any, any continued drop in core temperature, et cetera. Um, but uh, my question to you is, are you, is ESA, do you think you're planning on doing studies around looking at um, trying to suspend, uh, to, trying to create torpor in humans or see if you can extend or suspend um, these biological functions uh, and yet not do damage to the brain? Are, are there animal models that you're looking at or is there a plan to pursue this? <clears throat> yes, no, I, I, I have to say that I'm, I'm not a, a medical uh, doctor, so I'm, I'm, I'm not too much insight into all the detailed mechanisms. But what I can tell you is that this topical team I was just taking reference to has been funded since um, uh, about three years. We are just uh, in, in the discussions of extending this contract. This extension indeed will first look into additional um, uh, experiments or, or uh, studies with animals and in order to understand the mechanisms in mammals a little bit better before we, we would do uh, the next stage. So that is, yeah. Birds might be a particularly good animal model because 
birds can do this are heterotherms, and they do it routinely and uh, can tolerate extreme temperatures in both directions and, and seem to be able to go in and out of shallow torpor uh, um, without any difficulty. So just a, a thought. Thank you. Uh, Thomas, uh, you mentioned that ESA is looking at destination-based philosophy for exploration, and you know NASA has a capabilities-based approach. Can you say something about why ESA has yeah. chosen the destination methodology? Yes, um, I think that's that's a very good question, and um, I, I can tell you Jim, we had uh, we had a lot of discussions about that with our member states. As I said, we did this iteration for uh, for now almost uh, three years. Um, and uh, the reason why we um, finally convinced our member states to agree to this mission-based approach is that ESA does not have a very good record in uh, the capability-driven approach. We have uh, a couple of cases in the past decades where we um, were moving forward with developing certain capabilities. Then um, this uh, activity was completed, but it was never reused again. Um, I give you an example. We had um, with one of the first um, flights of the Ariane 5, we had a so called um, um, ARV, um, adva uh, ARD, adv advanced re entry demonstrator. Um, so to look into a re entry of a, of a capsule, uh, it flew once. Um, there was, of course, the idea behind it to further extend it, to reuse it in various areas. It was never, it, it never happened. And there are other examples like that. And this is the reason why we say, of, of course, it's, it's not this pure, only mission-driven and only capability. You, you always need to have first a certain, uh, let's say, um, uh, certainty that you are capable of uh, handling certain technologies. But uh, we think that uh, this mission-driven approach is um, the better approach, especially if you have uh, limited resources and um, uh, if you can achieve together with the member states really to do this uh, this uh, prioritization process in this wide range of, of technology activities and then not just do it until you say okay we increase the technology readiness level of uh, this broadband and then let's see where we can use it but we define a mission either as a as a European pure European mission or in an international cooperation say and for this mission we need to prioritize these and these activities. That is the main rationale behind it. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's not uh, um, that uh, all, all our stakeholders, all our member states would now fully agree, but this is uh, the consensus we achieved and why we uh, put that in the, in the strategy. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Thomas. Our first uh, first panel uh, this morning is really uh, uh, very appropriate to the topic that, uh, that Thomas just talked about. It gets into lunar exploration, and uh, Leroy Chow is the moderator. And uh, I think uh, the panelists, if they'd come forward and uh, take their seats here, we'll go ahead and get started. Leroy uh, is our moderator uh, this morning, and uh, Leroy, of course, has a great deal of experience in space flight. Uh, he became an astronaut in 1990 and uh, flew uh, on the shuttle on three flights, and uh, then took a uh, six-month mission uh, on board the uh, International Space Station, and uh, flew in uh, October 2004 to the spring of 2000, April 2005. And uh, then he has uh, since uh, left NASA and uh, is an adjunct professor here at Rice and also an entrepreneur as well. So let me turn it over to you.
Great. Thanks, George, and welcome, everyone. Uh, I think it's uh, great that we're having uh, this 10th ISMS. Uh, in addition to the interesting topics that we always have, it's always great to see everyone again, I think to especially our international partners that come from, from overseas. Well, as George mentioned, uh, I think lunar exploration is something that we're all interested in. I think everyone in this room is interested in. I was an eight-year-old kid when Apollo 11 landed on the moon, and that's what inspired me to, to start dreaming about wanting to become an astronaut myself. Uh, as you know, of course, the United States right now is not centered on bringing humans back to the surface of the moon, and I think we're definitely in the minority there. Uh, there are a lot of debates about whether we should be going, trying to go directly to Mars uh, instead, and certainly even in the commercial sector, Elon Musk has no interest in the moon at all. Uh, he thinks that, uh, and he's pushing to go, go to Mars first. However, I think there are a lot of very good reasons to go back to the moon, uh, not only scientific reasons, but operational reasons for making sure our hard where is robust and it's going to work and we test everything out. Also, it's a good place to train crew. You don't necessarily want the first crew on Mars uh, to have never worked in a reduced gravity, reduced atmosphere environment. And so uh, for those reasons, I'm very much in support of, of going to the moon. Thomas, thanks for the excellent uh, presentation you just gave. You heard the Europeans have been talking to Russians for many years now about going to the moon, including bringing astronauts, both European and Russian uh, astronauts, cosmonauts, to the moon. China very recently in the last few months uh, admitted to their open secret, what it, everyone in the business knew was an open secret, China intends to land their astronauts on the moon. And so uh, to me, it makes a lot of sense to use the International Space Station model where the United States is the lead partner. After all, we're the only nation that has landed people on the moon. And very glad that we have uh, Tom Stafford here and Walt Cunningham who, who are both part of the Apollo program. Uh, but uh, you know, it makes a lot of sense to me to go that direction. So uh, very interested in hearing the uh, other panel members' opinions on these issues as well as your questions from the audience. And so in the interest of time, I'll go ahead and, and introduce uh, each panelist one at a time and then ask each panelist to make a short statement or, or say a few words and then we'll have a discussion and open it up, up for, for questions. So our first panelist is, uh, is Bonnie Dunbar, and of course, uh, Bonnie uh, is a veteran astronaut. Uh, she and I overlapped for many years in the, in the astronaut office. Uh, Bonnie flew five space shuttle missions during her time, including, was it two space lab flights? Right, two space lab flights. So of course, we didn't have ISS back then, and, and she did a lot of, of research. Of course, she's a PhD. Uh, she also has held many different positions, including the uh, director of the Museum of Flight in Seattle. And then she was at the University of Houston as the uh, at the STEM Center, the director of the STEM Center uh, in the Cullen, Cullen College of Engineering, and currently serves as the director of the Institute for Engineering, Education, and Innovation, uh, which is a joint entity in the Texas A&M Engineering Experiment Station and the Dwight Look College of Engineering at Texas A&M University. So, Bonnie? Well, thank you very much. appreciate the opportunity, uh, Leroy, to say a few things. Uh, first of all, I'd just note that we're in a very special place here at Rice University. In 1962, and I am slightly older than you are, I was just an emerging teenager when President John Fitzgerald Kennedy made a very famous speech from here in the football stadium. And uh, the speech is still available online. I encourage you, if you haven't uh, listened to it recently, to do so. But uh, just to review a couple of his lines, he said, we choose to go to this moon, to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard, because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one we're willing to accept, one we're unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. Well, growing up in Washington State at the time uh, and studying Washington State history, I was also immersed in the mission of Lewis and Clark. Uh, everything that surrounded me at that time was named after both or one or the other, uh, colleges, uh, counties, cities, Lewis and Clark. Uh, that was a 200-year-old mission of exploration. Of what we call it. it was called the mission of, of discovery, as a matter of fact, a scientific mission put together by President Jefferson at the time. And so we, I grew up steeped in the need to explore, uh, both intellectually as well as physically. And it was an exciting time to hear about this mission to the moon. In fact, it was what brought me into engineering. 
So that's kind of what I want to talk about a little bit here is, is looking at the moon not just as a destination, uh, the nearest one outside of uh, Earth orbit, but as a necessary precursor as we explore beyond because of the environments it provides us for engineering development. I went on to become an engineer for Rockwell International helping to build the space shuttle. It took us a long time to conquer some of the, the challenges, the main engine system and especially the thermal protection system, which I started working on in 1968, and then was working on Columbia at uh, Palmdale in the 1970s before it flew. So we need to think of the moon as an analog, uh, as an engineering and science test facility with variables that cannot be duplicated on the Earth. We all know what the technology readiness levels are, the TRL levels, and the necessity to test an environment uh, before we proceed to production. I also had the opportunity as being a member of the National Academy of Engineers of leading uh, the sub-panel that reviewed six technology areas as part of the review of the NASA, uh, NASA technology uh, roadmaps. All those involved humans. Humans require that we understand liquids, you know, gases, fluids, uh, because we have life support systems. When we send rovers to Mars, for example, we, we really don't have to worry as much about that, those robotic systems. We start getting into life support systems and liquid fuel systems, and we have to understand uh, fluid physics in a way that we don't normally have to understand. It's one of the reasons we do so much on the International Space Station. Before we flew to the moon, in order to understand fluids, we uh, performed drop tower tests, we, we did sounding rocket tests, we even flew the KC-135 hundreds of times to understand how fluids behaved. Why is that necessary? Because that helps us understand heat transfer and mass transport, all parts of keeping people alive in space. The moon provides us a unique platform. It has a variable gravity environment. We just simply cannot duplicate that here. That's going to drive everything in terms of human sustainability in, uh, in, on Mars. And getting between zero and one is a difficult place to be. We have no theoretical models that predict this right now. Uh, we don't have empirical data for long periods of time on the, Mar on, on the surface of the moon. So we need to get between zero and one. It reduces risk and increases mission success. There are other variables like radiation, for example, that we need to understand. Reduced uh, pressure, uh, which is, uh, even though Mars uh, has a little bit of CO2, it's a reduced pressure environment. So what I'm doing at uh, Texas A&M right now is starting a new laboratory on spacesuit development. Uh, we need surface spacesuits, suits that are going to be transparent to the human. They're going to be out there doing operations for long periods of time. Can't be a source of injury. Uh, have to, there, where our crew members are going to be, uh, you know, out being planetary uh, geologists, uh, repairing equipment out there. So we need to understand how to reduce mask, uh, mass, how to have reliable life support systems uh, on board the suit, uh, how to uh, optimize communications, any number of things. It's a small. Uh, space station that they're walking around in. So we hope that by driving that suit technology, uh, we also uh, uh, perform research in life support systems. So we need to be thinking of the moon as a destination, a near-term destination, but also as a research laboratory for engineering as well as human health and performance. Where is the threshold for bone loss? We don't know that. Dr. Uh, Charles has a, a great graph, you know, zero and one, and what's in between, we don't know. So I look at the moon as another platform. I had three space lab flights. Those space lab flights all contributed to the success of the International Space Station from all the research that we did. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Bonnie. Our next panelist is Oleg Kotov. Uh, Oleg and I got to know each other in Star City. We were overlapped several years there during training. Uh, Oleg actually started life as a, as a medical doctor, a physician assigned to the Soviet space program before joining the uh, cosmonaut corps. He's flown two long duration flights, so he's got twice as much time in space as, as I do uh, aboard the ISS. And uh, most recently, he served as uh, uh, the commander of the Soyuz TMA-10M. Uh, since uh, since retiring from flight, he has held a different uh, several different leadership positions, and he currently serves as the chief of uh, human spaceflight scientific investigations at uh, Stini Mesh. So, Oleg. Uh, hello, everyone. But uh, I, I should have a very difficult decision. Everyone has like this one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
Добрый день все. Good day, everybody. I would like to speak in Russian. It will be easier for me. I'm very happy to be here together with you at Rice University. This is not my first participation in the medical space medical summit. That is uh, a great opportunity to discuss for future development of not only medicine but space exploration in general. Том, что делать после МКС, действительно, or ask a question, what to do after ISS? космические агентства that is true, all задали, space agencies задали, продолжают задавать себе этот вопрос keep asking this question уже несколько лет. Various forms for several years already. Where will humanity move next? Uh, it is obvious that we have a common idea as to go to Mars and uh, lunar base might be the intermediate. Uh, uh, we are going to Mars for reaching. Lunar surface, if we look at different agencies, how to use uh, lunar space uh, is quite different. Different countries have different visions. With Roscosmos, uh, the main idea is to land on the moon, uh, but not to land on the moon just temporarily, like uh, get there and come back like a military program, not at all, but we would like to have a, a base on the moon uh, that will be permanent post, human post, uh, that will allow us uh, to have deep research. And if you look at different strategies of other uh, agencies, then mostly they are looking at it as the place to develop technologies for further mission to Mars. Uh, the international team that is working in this direction trying to combine these approaches and work out some common strategy for everybody. Because there is no doubt that missions should be performed in international format. A single agency is not able to achieve a goal like that. That is very complex to fly to the moon and especially further to Mars. Uh, the great uh, experience of international cooperation that we have uh, already with ISS, that we shouldn't lose that. Another serious question that is being discussed now is whether it makes sense to the low Earth orbit. Of course, ideally, uh, it would be nice to commercialize Earth orbit and allow the private commercial companies continue exploration near Earth. Roscosmos continues to go into this area and into the possibility of giving idea for some industries to develop on low Earth orbit. In particular, quite clear that the transportation system can be provided by commercial companies. However, creation of long-term inhabited base, oh, uh, no, one or two or more modules, uh, that is quite problematic, and we don't see any movement in the uh, commercial area towards that. Uh, in Russia, we are also looking at possibility to keep a uh, governmental state role of uh, uh, keeping uh, near-Earth infrastructure.
применительно к полетам дальше на Луну и далее. Хотелось бы отметить такое взаимо Problem. I want to point out some issue, if you may say so, uh, how to provide for long-term mission. Sometimes it is mixed up with the deep space exploration. From medical and technological point of view, this is quite a different thing. If we say that we need to look into the possibility of a human being working in uh, long-term mission, we should not say, we should also look into the questions of uh, uh, hypermagnetic capabilities, uh, remote areas, deep space, staying there for a long time. Uh, also, we have to look at psychological support of this kind of missions. Well, I try to touch upon just main topics uh, that are being resolved by uh, International Space Committees. I'm ready to answer your questions. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Oleg. Our next panelist has a, had a long and distinguished and continuously active career in human spaceflight. Uh, Michael Lembeck is currently the president of CEP Stone LLC here in Houston. Uh, he's provided subject matter expertise to many companies, including Wiley, now KBR Wiley, uh, CSRA, and for, to the Boeing Company on their commercial CST-100 vehicle program. Uh, before that, he was the corporate lead executive for Northrop Grumman's uh, Houston operations. Uh, he did a, a long stint at, uh, at headquarters as the requirements division director for the Exploration System Mission Directorate. Uh, he, was the, uh, he participated in the formulation of President Bush 41's Vision for Space Exploration, VSE, uh, which had it gone, would have put, been on schedule, the schedule would have been to put us onto Mars in, in, in about three years from now. Um, of course, that didn't work out. But he also uh, managed the original development of requirements for the Constellation Orion program. Prior to joining NASA, he also served as a vice president for remote sensing programs at Orbital Sciences. Um, Mike? Thanks, Larry. Well, I, it's a real honor to be here among this esteemed panel, and uh, I'm probably the oddball out in that I'm the engineer, and I wanted to maybe give you a little bit of that flavor for how some of these architectures come together. And uh, also, maybe to take a little heat off our, our current administration and, uh, and how you know, we're, we're doing today. Uh, back in 2003 or so, the uh, president came in to NASA and said, what do you guys do? That's a true story. And we responded with, well, you know, we fly space shuttles to do the space station. He says, yeah, but we want some bigger picture stuff. Where do we go from here when the station is done and we, we've learned all we can? And so we set about to determine an architecture for moving on, to, as Leroy said, to the moon, Mars, and beyond. And as part of that, the first thing we did, we had, since we had such an empty plate at that time, um, you can imagine there's been probably 10 to 15 groups like ours over the history of NASA that have repeatedly looked at different architectures from different points of view with different political winds at their back. And we had a pretty open plate at that time given to us by the president to explore all options. So one of the things we did was formed a concept exploration and refinement study. And we reached out beyond the typical NASA contractors to 11 different teams, all the way down to a group we called uh, T-Space, that was a commercial group. And we wanted them to reflect on different mission opportunities for getting to the moon and Mars and, and try to look through those 11 perpendicular studies and determine what were the common elements, what are the first things we really have to worry about to get moving forward. And what came out of that study was uh, eventually Orion and SLS. We, we determined we certainly needed a transportation vehicle that would carry us to orbit and beyond uh, after the shuttle had retired, and we would need some large capacity for lofting payloads into orbit. Now, you can argue, and we did, about how best to do that, whether to take it up in small pieces, to do large chunks like an SLS, and I would say that, for the most part, many of those arguments are equally convincing, both from a cost and performance point of view. 
However, you have to take a path, and eventually the country moved on with some political support to develop Orion and SLS. So that's where we are today. And I would argue that that is probably not a bad place to be for where we are today. And the other things we could have done would have gotten us to an equally point in, in the development. So as we started to look then at what are the next steps, what do we have to do to make sure this hardware will take us to our destinations and we can function efficiently as humans at those destinations, we gathered the stockholders and started to ask them questions about what is it that we want to accomplish, how best to accomplish it, what are the things that concern you most. And that leads to a strategy, to a task, to a technology portfolio. And we developed that path to lay out what we needed to do in order to develop the, the next steps. And some of the things we learned as we were looking forward is that there's really a lot of uh, concern, as Bonnie pointed out, about what is between zero gravity and 1G in terms of human performance. We do not know if there is a threshold of gravity that will eliminate a lot of the problems that are caused by exposure in long duration to zero gravity. So the moon's a good place to start. One sixth is a, a nice dot on the scale. It's somewhere just short of three eighths, which is the, probably the next step of the moon and eventually to uh, Mars. Um, one of the th arguments we had uh, a lot as engineers is talking to the folks in the space medicine group. Um, I would argue, as did a lot of my colleagues, that if you gave us the billion dollars or so that is spent on uh, determining uh, mitigations to humans in zero gravity, we could turn around and develop you a partial G vehicle to get to where you want to go and eliminate all of those problems. And yet the, the community is still kind of favored the zero gravity mode for transportation. And sooner or later, we will come around for long duration missions to doing partial gravity vehicles, I can assure you as an engineer. Um, so, but there are other things to do on the moon. As Bonnie pointed out, fluid systems. We don't have a lot of experience with developing fluid systems in partial G. That's a good place to start. Uh, you can also check out exploration equipment. You can check out propulsive landing systems, advanced power systems. Um, at some point, we'll probably want to use nuclear systems. And as you move on to, to thinking about moving on to Mars, one of the, th the things that's interesting is that space, you know, is, is a pretty big place. It's an ocean, and you're not going to cross an ocean in a rowboat. So the moon is a pretty good place to start thinking about developing high-speed propulsion, nuclear propulsion. We can use the surface area to do some of the things that perhaps we can't do here on Earth. But ultimately, the moon can also be a dead end, and I think that's reflected in the current administration's approach, and you have to respect that. Because if we bog ourselves down with developing fuel depots and, propulsion s and chemical propulsion systems based on 1970s technology, we will never make it out to the outer fringes of the solar system. So I think in the end I'd like to point out that there are good approaches, there are bad approaches, but most of these approaches come from good places. There are different ways of, of getting to where you want to go. And ultimately, we have to deal with the realities of being humans. We do not like exposure to zero gravity, to radiation, to all these problems. One of the quickest mitigators of taking care of that is to go very quickly through that environment to where we want to be. So, thank you. Thank you, Mike. <clears throat> Our next panelist, uh, Lee Morin, is a rarity in this room. He's still an active astronaut. Uh, Lee is one of these guys that has both an MD and a PhD, and I know there are a few more of you guys in here, so uh, I'm sure you'll you'll let us know. Um, but Lee is, uh, let's see, he was a, an astronaut for many years, still is. His spaceflight experience, he flew aboard STS-110 as a mission specialist, which was the 13th shuttle mission to the ISS. Uh, one of the critical things that STS-110 did was to deliver the S-0 truss, which formed the backbone of the rest of the truss segments, which, of course, uh, to, to which, of course, are attached to the large American solar arrays. Uh, Lee participated in two EVAs, two spacewalks, in going out and installing the S-0 truss, and his EVA times totals over 14 hours. So, Lee? Thanks, Lee Roy. It's, it's a great privilege to be here. And uh, let me just say that... Uh, Certainly the pinnacle of my career was helping bolt on the s Truss, which is held together on the space station with about 30 bolts. And I was privileged to tighten 12 of those bolts. <laughs> that works out to about two years of education per bolt. So, <laughs> uh, I've been... Uh, 
very privileged to be able to remain in the astronaut in a management capacity and to work uh, and, and develop a uh, rapid prototyping lab for the crew interfaces for future vehicles, specifically Orion. And so we're tasked with building the displays and controls for Orion and are closely partnered in an agile team with Lockheed Martin. Uh, and we have a, uh, a milestone there that we just actually reached yesterday, which we had the fir our first mini integrated sim uh, with crew and with a small uh, flight control room uh, nearby with the flight director, flight control team. Uh, and we were able to, for the first time, uh, have the crew say, well, this was really a convincing and made me feel like I was really sitting in a, uh, a spacecraft instead of a, a piece of a spacecraft. So that's one tiny step towards uh, having Orion fly. Uh, some of the challenges with Orion, uh, of course, we're, we're looking at having a, um, the first unmanned EM-1 mission in uh, about two years, and then a manned mission uh, reaching out for the first time since the early 70s out uh, around the moon with a crew, which really has some daunting challenges. Uh, you know, from my uh, perspective, down on the deck plates, uh, we're building an all-glass cockpit. The shuttle had about 250 pounds of books called uh, Flight Data File, or FDF. All of that will be on the glass. There'll basically be one pound of books, which is how do you reboot the computer when it uh, goes away. Uh, <laughs> a lot of interesting challenges. Uh, one is the blend of automation. Some of the things we didn't have during the Apollo era were the, uh, the tremendous amount of computers that we have now, and that's a blessing and a curse. And, uh, and, and we have a lot of automation, and of course EM-1 is going to be basically a robotic mission with some control from the ground. Uh, EM-2, we want to have the uh, humans on board be able to monitor the automation, intercede, and do uh, manual control where appropriate, uh, and building uh, something that is between the fully manual machine uh, and the fully automated machine, that's the real challenge of, of blending those two. Uh, and another is to have computers that uh, with the, it's easy to do millions of lines of code, you know, a Google Chrome browser is five and a half million lines of code, 31,000 files written in 31 languages, but if you look at that as making reliable flight software, uh, that's not really the process that, uh, that we use, and so we've had to, uh, you know, build our equivalent of Google Chrome, which represents the, uh, represents the flight data file with about 2,500 lines of code, so that has been a challenge, so. Uh, and so anyway, so that's, uh, you know, we're, we're getting there in terms of um, uh, having America have a, a radiation tolerant deep space uh, machine uh, with enough computers so that when they go down, the others can uh, run things until the, the, uh, they can come back up from the radiation hits. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm proud of the uh, contributions that we've been able to make to help restore that little piece of that capability that we need. Uh, and just in terms of one comment about the moon going to the other extreme from the deck plates to the uh, thinking about what we could do, what could we do on the moon? Uh, uh, some of us, including uh, Don Pettit, who's here in the room, uh, have done some thinking about some ideas. And we think that a, doing a bootstrapping approach with lunar in situ resource development uh, with a small robotic, uh, you know, thousand kilogram surveyor type mission able to do dexterous robotics to do material processing of the regolith itself to allow you to start to make things on the moon. And so you're talking about making, with very humble uh, approach, making Lego, bo uh, Lego blocks and erector set parts and exploiting what is on the moon to build parts that help you build more things. And so you could build very humble robots, but they would be good enough uh, to help you extend. And the key is to turn the space industry from a, a industry that is concerned about moving mass from here, say, to the surface of the moon at huge expense, over $100,000 a pound, to moving information. And that's something we know how to do much, much better than we did during the Apollo era. We can, you know, we, many of us have a satellite dish uh, behind our, uh, you know, behind our um, home that is, uh, uh, you know, tremendous more bandwidth than was available in Apollo coming from, from uh, pretty far out. So anyway, with that, I'd like to uh, uh, hand it off to the next speaker, Thomas. Okay. Thank you, Lee. Keyword. <clears throat>
Our next panelist, Thomas Reiter, of course, we've already heard from Thomas, but I'll <clears throat> just add a few more uh, uh, words about his, his professional career and then give him a chance to go off uh, prepared remarks. Uh, Thomas uh, is also a brigadier general in addition to being an astronaut, and he currently serves as the director of human spaceflight and operations at ESA. Uh, also, Tomas is one of the few people who've flown both on Mir, he flew on Euromir, and uh, also flew aboard ISS. To the Euro Euromir mission, of course, he flew aboard a Soyuz, and to ISS during Expedition 1314, he went up and down on space shuttles. So, uh, Tomas? Thank you very much. Um, well, um, ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, I can keep it a little bit shorter on, on uh, ESA's view on the moon, but I would like to uh, pick up on, on a remark that, uh, Mike, you made on uh, the question, you know, can moon be a dead end? Um, and I do that because, obviously, in, in this discussion that I was uh, describing before, when we had this iteration with our member states, how to develop this, um, uh, this exploration strategy, there was always this connotation of, you know, are we discussing one destination against the other? And I think this is um, very detrimental, um, and, and it is something we should avoid, and at the end, um, we convinced our stakeholders that um, exactly the um, generation of a, of, a, of a space strategy um, is trying to overcome this uh, contradiction. It's not one or the other destination. It's a question of how can we achieve with more or less resources all these uh, destinations. It's a question of sequence. It's a question of international cooperation. And therefore, I, I think um, while we have I heard from all of you um, um, a lot of uh, very, very important ideas about maturation of technologies, um, additional um, knowledge that we need to gain about uh, the human being uh, to sustain extended periods of weightlessness or partial gravity. I think that is all very important, but at the same time, I think we need uh, to convince the political side, the public, that it's not a question of one or the other, um, but it's a question of how do we do the sequence, how can we tune the various steps to come at the end, of course, to bring humans to Mars. And if it's, you know, if, if I just may say that bluntly, if it's uh, five years earlier or later, that should not be uh, the big concern. It should be clear that whatever step we take today, starting from ISS, starting from using this platform for maturing certain operational capabilities and technologies, that this is leading towards this, this long-term goal of, of extending human presence in our solar system. And Mars is, I mean, from the current point of view, is, is probably, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit reluctant to say the ultimate goal, but there are for sure um, in maybe 20, 30 years destinations which are even beyond Mars. So I think this is a, a very important task that is ahead of us and that we can only solve all together. It's not the question of one agency, um, um, you know, having the solution for that. If we can demonstrate that we are pursuing um, a, a common um, a common strategy and with Isaac I mean we started Isaac is not binding for the for the uh, um, uh, involved agencies which are 14 um, in, in in the meantime 14 agencies worldwide who are contributing but from that we can, we have an orientation and if we convince our uh, stakeholders that Whatever step we take today is leading towards this common goal. I think that um, would be also a very important achievement, also for, at the end, <coughs> then um, asking for, for the necessary funding. Thank you. Thank you, Tomas. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm very pleased to introduce our next panelist, uh, Salajan Sharipov. I describe him as the brother I never had, having grown up with, with two sisters. Salajan and I, of course, flew together on Expedition 10, which is long duration flight, and, uh, but he certainly has done a lot more than that in his career. Uh, Salajan was actually the, the youngest full colonel in the Russian Air Force at the time, uh, which was quite an achievement since uh, he's actually not even uh, ethnically, he's, he's an Uzbek who was born and grew up in neighboring Kyrgyzia. 
but he dreamed about being a pilot, about being an Air Force pilot. He joined the Soviet Air Force. <clears throat> he met, went through flight school, and he got to fly aircraft like the L-39, which is about the coolest uh, airplane that you can, you know, if you're wealthy enough, you can buy one for yourself. Uh, but he also got to fly the MiG-21, which when I was growing up, I was always, you know, studying airplanes and reading books, and the MiG-21 was one of the meanest looking airplanes I, th I think I'd ever seen. So I think that would have been a pretty cool experience. Uh, Salazar got to fly twice in space. He, his first flight was aboard a space shuttle during uh, the Phase One program when we were beginning our cooperation with Russia. And then he, he and I trained together for many years in, in Star City, uh, launched aboard Soyuz TMA-5, which, where he served as commander. And then we flew to the ISS, where we uh, served together during Expedition 10. Along that way, he got to do two uh, EVAs, and I got to do two Russian EVAs with him, which was really a treat. And uh, one of the big highlights of, of our EVAs was that uh, Salzhen got to deploy a nanosat. He just had a little, little copy can size satellite that he threw off the back of the station, and fortunately didn't hit any of the solar arrays or anything like that, and so uh, didn't get fined. Got, probably got a bonus for that. But anyway, I'll uh, turn it over to Salzhen to, to please give us your comments. Добрый день, дорогие друзья. Ознакомление было, по-моему, дольше всех. I think my introduction was the longest. Uh, although I am more important, Thomas is just next to me. Thomas Stafford is next to me. Probably you can talk about him much longer. Of course. I would love to be a part of the Luna program, but I think this will be the next generation. Maybe our children, our grandchildren will enjoy that. There are a lot of questions to be resolved already today. We say that the different agencies have different points of view, and our space agency is defining already exactly what they want from it. Alec Kotov already said a few words about that, and I join him over there. I don't want to um, add much more. Just will be happy to answer your questions, and I'll be happy to participate in the discussion. Gary, and last and certainly not least, our most distinguished panelist here, I think, uh, Tom Stafford, uh, you know, made it to the moon, made it this close to landing, and but he, he didn't quite get to the surface, but he got a whole lot closer than any of the rest of us in, in this room. So Tom, of course, is a veteran uh, Air Force test pilot and uh, an astronaut. He flew uh, numerous aircraft before joining NASA, uh, served on two Gemini flights, and then was the commander of Apollo 10, uh, which was the dress rehearsal coming over. Well, you can tell us how close to the moon, pretty darn close, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, didn't, didn't quite land. He also served as the commander of the Apollo Soyuz test program, and, and that's a very important first step. And in, in fact, uh, I'm wearing my Apollo Soyuz test program tie here to, to kind of commemorate that. Uh, that was the first step towards officially having a, a program with, with the Soviet Union, with the Russian space program. Uh, and I think that set the stage for the robust cooperation uh, mm -hmm. that we enjoy today. So Tom has also made six rendezvous in, in space, manually flying rendezvous, uh, which is uh, probably the hardest thing, uh, hardest thing we can, we've done in space. And he's logged over 507 hours in space flight and flown over 120 different types of fixed wing and rotary aircraft and four different types of spacecraft. So Tom. Thank you, Leroy. And it's a real honor to be here today to attend the uh, symposium and uh, the um, I was very fortunate to be here in the pioneering days of the United States Space Program to fly the two Gemini missions. In fact, I was a backup pilot for the very first uh, Gemini flight. And then I was also the backup commander for the first Apollo flight. And uh, I'm reminded of the words of the great, I'll paraphrase the words of the great American writer, George Santayana. His words were basically, those that ignore the lessons of history are doomed to repeat them. And when we talk about going to Mars, I draw an analog. If we had not had the Gemini program, the Apollo program would have been a complete disaster. 
And I can say that since I was in the middle of both of them. And uh, we learned how to do rendezvous. We learned long duration missions. We learned about spacewalking. In fact, um, every time you do something new, new, you're going to learn something. And so it's the same analog from Gemini to Apollo as going back to the moon, working out a series of things, and then you go to Mars. And uh, for example, on my second Gemini mission, my pilot, Gene Cernan, was going to be the first one to walk in space completely around the world and to fly a rocket backpack. Now, all we'd had before that was Alexei Apeyevich Lyonov doing about 12 minutes outside in space. And all we saw was a picture. And he, Alexei said, everything is fine. <laughs> well, later, as I got to know Alexei, I found out everything wasn't fine. <laughs> and uh, I'm glad. I wish we'd known that. So if you look at the, in the old manifest, I was going to do the first spacewalk, a very simple thing with the rendezvous, and that was just a double-length hose, open the hatch, stand up, turn around, close the hatch, sit down. But, you know, it was the day of the Holodny Vina. And so the Soviets had had the first spacewalk. We had to respond. So they put Ed White out with a rudimentary backpack, no special spacesuit. And he was out for about 22 minutes. But when he came back in, he had the same problem that Leonov had. His suit ballooned. And of course, in Germany, the critical height was, was your length. And so the suit balloons this way, it balloons this way. And we, and we had to do what we call the alley-oop maneuver. There's a little bar underneath the instrument panel where you'd grab a hold and bend double and get down and then dog the hatch home. Well, White's suit ballooned and uh, he couldn't get it closed. He finally was, I guess the adrenaline was really flowing. His heart rate, as uh, Willie probably remembers, was over 220 beats a minute. And Ed finally got it closed. But, you know, here, okay, we'll make some modifications. So Gene Cernan did have a seven-layer suit. He still had, uh, he had a modified, uh, improved ventilation system. And he was going out and fly this Air Force experiment, a rocket pack that had hot jets on it, hydrogen peroxide over a catalyst. And to keep from burning holes in the legs, we had this Inconel layers, uh, knitted Inconel layer of steel over his trousers so if the jets would fire on him, it wouldn't burn holes in his legs. <laughs> it's a saying, my weren't we brave, but my weren't we dumb. <laughs> And uh, so Cernan goes out, uh, depressurized, Cernan goes outside, and we had no way of simulating this. We had a, about a 20 by 20 square foot uh, polished steel table and air bearings, and Cernan would try to move around like that. That was the only simulation we had. And we had no hand holes, we had no tether restraints, we had no foot restraints. And uh, so we depressurized the spacecraft. He did put a, a convex mirror on the docking bar we had up in front. The Agena had blown up, and all we had was a, a, another vehicle called the Augmented Target Docking Adapter. I nicknamed it the Angry Alligator. Some of you might remember that. I also called it a few other names, too. <laughs> So, so anyway, I, I nixed the idea of going out and trying to get those panels deployed. And uh, so CERN was out, and he was thrashing around. And boy, Newton's law of motion came very obvious to me. For every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction. He was torquing that. Gemini spacecraft all over the place. I was flying in a pulse mode, and then he'd fly back over me, and I'd stop thrusting. So I couldn't, I didn't want to fire those thrusters when he was back there. 
Then he'd work back, but he was huffing and puffing. So it finally came time for him to go to the back. We didn't have footholds, so he was to get in there, and he had just a bar, so he locked one foot over the other on a bar. And he was sitting in there, and we'd gone through a practice where he was blindfolded and dry it. And he had a 25-foot long umbilical, very insulated, and communications and oxygen. And we didn't have any, you know, water-cooled garments. All we had was just a small blower to evaporate water and blow air over him. And obviously his metabolic rate certainly overcame that in a hurry. And anyway, first when he was standing up there trying to hold on, we're going small in forward, and he started to say, Tom, my back is killing me. I said, what's wrong, Gene? I said, I don't know, my back is burning up. I said, I, I could look in the convex mirror ahead, and I could tell the sun's behind. I said, do you want me to yaw the spacecraft around and get out of the sun? He says, no, keep going. Well, it turns out his seven layers of insulation had split from the zipper, so the flux of the sun went right into his back. And so Gene, after he got back, had a second degree burn about this long on his back. And uh, we learned how to make connections to zippers better. <laughs> the, uh, so he got in there. But also the moment the sun went down, he fogged, just bang. He could not see. His, his visor was completely fogged over. But he had gone through this thing, so he got strapped into the astronaut maneuvering unit. And we're down to three steps to go. And, and then I would throw a switch that would explode a bolt and cut him loose. And he, then he would ha be on the life support system of the backpack. And he had a 100-foot high-tense nylon tether and, there, and a radio transmitter with oxygen. And uh, anyway, he, he still couldn't see. And then he tr we tried his communication there, we lost one way of two-way communications. And I'll never forget this. Also, the hatch was sticking open when the hatch was there. We learned this from uh, uh, Ed White's thing. To help get the hatch hold, we developed a simple over-the-center mechanism. It was like an aluminum I-beam with a steel cable. So the commander could take and do this and slam the hatch down. And fortunately, we, we had that. You learn as you go. So Cernan was there, and I remember coming over Australia, and the Southern Cross was coming up, and there, and the hatch was sticky, and my partner was about 18 foot back, and he could not see, and I said, darn, it's lonely out here. <laughs> so I, I said, Gene, we're going to wait till sunrise. We'll give it 10 minutes. If you don't defog by 10 minutes after sunrise, we're calling this spacewalk quit. The CVA is quit. Well, the sun came up, and the <coughs> fog didn't go away, so I said, okay, let's get, we're going to get back in the spacecraft. I want you back in before the next sunset. So, again, he was completely blind, could not see. So I got a hold of the the big tether and started pulling it in. Now, Gemini was so small, you couldn't put your feet together in the foot well. You had to ride with one foot on the other. So I started pulling the snake in, and I could look at the rear view mirror, and so Cernan could not see. We did have a rail down the back of the, the Gemini spacecraft, and so I told him where to put his hand, and he finally got a hold of a rail, and then he could walk hand over hand and I would look at that rear view mirror and tell him where how to swing his body. He finally swung his body around, and I reached out and I was pressurized, you know. With one hand, I grabbed a boot. And with that, fortunately, I could get him down and put his feet in the ejection seat. And I turned him to what I would think would be the, the best angle for the sun. And so he was, I had him facing the sun. He still could not see that fog would not burn off. So I came up with an idea. I said, Gino, take your, your fist and take the helmet rail, your locking device, put it up as far as you can towards your neck and take your nose and try to rub a hole in, it, in the fog, which he did. And so he had a little hole like that that he could see out of. 
and, but, but that wasn't enough to get him in. So. And again, we, we were on a trajectory that when, I think we had about a two minute pass over Perth, Australia, and then he went way south of way. So I had about 30 minutes. I didn't, couldn't talk to anybody. All this was going on. And um, finally, by the time we did hit the Guaymas tracking station, I gave him the status. I was getting him back in. And so we started this back. Uh, I started getting him back in, pulling his snake in. And, and his suit was stiff. It was hard. You know, Jiminy was a great suit, 25 pounds, unpressurized, pressurized. It was rigid. You moved your hand and you had to hold it. If not, bang, it would go back. So I think he burned, it was calculated, he burned about 4,500 BTUs an hour. So in that two hours and five minutes outside, Cernan lost 13 pounds of weight. And so now it came in to get him into the spacecraft. And he tried to get in and do the alley-oop maneuver. And he got in and he just could not get his head down because his suit had ballooned. We had about that far to go. So then, fortunately, due to Ed White's experience, we, we developed that over the center mechanism. And I pulled that T-bar all I could. Then I could hold it with one hand. My suit was pressurized. I slammed it, the hatch down, and so it was flushed. It still wasn't locked. And then I took this hand, got his hand up to the hatch, told him to start dogging it home. And you could hear it click, 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 click. So he got it home, and then I turned the pressurization up, and the suit started to deflate. And we finally got five PSI. We flew at five PSI, pure oxygen. And he opened his faceplate, and his face was absolutely pink, like he'd been in the sauna too long. So I just tucked the water gun and hosed him down. And to, you're not supposed to have water in a spacecraft, but there's no, I didn't have any choice. I needed to cool him off. So I said, start drinking. And uh, it was a real bear, I'll tell you. So that night, um, so we had, went out a short sleep period, but, he said he was freezing, so I turned the heat, the rudimentary heat control we had full up. I was hot and sweaty all night, and he was freezing all night. We landed the next day, and they got his suit back to Houston there, and they poured over a pound and a half of water out of each boot. And so right then we said, hey, time out. Let's really understand how do we simulate of walking and working in space? And from that, a series of ideas came forth. And from that, we said, if we start maybe training underwater in neutral buoyancy, then that might give us a chance. So over in Building 5, we got an old oil-filled storage tank. And sandblasted, cleaned it up, painted white, put some windows in it, and started doing some rudimentary things. Now, meanwhile, we're, the Gemini program was a fast-moving program. We did. 10 missions in 20 months. So 10 started out, um, and he had an EVA, and Mike Collins, he had a hard time on, on his EVA, but fortunately he didn't balloon as much as Cernan, so he got back in, and we didn't have enough time. We didn't have the water facility available. Same with 11, Dick Gordon got overheated, lost weight. But finally, 12th of the last mission, for Buzz Aldrin with Gene Cern the backup, we had a, a water facility, a little one, where they could do some, and with some restraints we put on, hand holes, tether, and that was the first time we could then do a spacewalk and do training and, and do precise work without overheating. So. You need to understand these steps because every time you do something new, you're going to have problems, believe me. But the idea of training underwater, which we do now, came from Gemini 9. And that's why you look at the space station, I think we've had 137 spacewalks. And it's gone real well because if you've had a spacewalk, you get underwater training, you go there for six or seven hours using nitrox, and there's no problem. So this brings me back to the the analysis that if we don't go to the moon and plan all this activity besides exploration, and from that, the same thing, 
Well, the moon was 16% gravity. Mars was 38% gravity. We're going to have a tough time. I, I think it'll be a disaster because Apollo would have been a disaster. All the lessons we learned from Gemini, both on spacewalking and also rendezvous particularly, if we hadn't had that, we just wouldn't have been able to do it. And uh, then as far as looking at Mars, I got deeply involved with this when President Bush Sr. said on the 20th anniversary of the first lunar landing that he wanted to set for a goal that sometime, this was in 1989, that we will go back, finish the space station, go back to the moon after the turn of the century and maybe in the second decade have an expedition to Mars. So NASA came up with a study, but uh, it was uh, really kind of protects your own goal watch. <laughs> and, uh, and the word got out, it cost $500 billion, the Congress went wild. And so anyway, I got a call from Dick Truly and I said that the vice president wanted to see me. And I had been selected, if I would volunteer, to head, put together a study group to say what is the best way to carry out President Bush's vision for space exploration that Mike knows about. How to go back to the moon in a way that's faster, better, safer, and less cost. I don't want to use the word cheap because nothing is cheap. And from that, uh, we put together a team and George Abbey was my deputy. He did most of the work. <laughs> I signed my name to it, but I kind of helped. The two of us set the strategy, but George did most of the work. And we had a 45 people full time. And then uh, we had uh, uh, a three star general head of space uh, division in Los Angeles that had 140 people. And then we had the Rand Corporation take ideas from all over the United States and they had industry, aerospace and otherwise come in and talk to us. At the end of 11 months, we published this book called America at the Threshold, How to Go Back to the Moon and On to Mars. And uh, the, uh, it's on, available on the internet, it's still looking in some ways, but I think the principles there are about the same as they are today. And one of the main things, you've got to have a heavy lift booster to get back to the moon with any type of, you know, equipment to do any work at all. And we said 150 metric tons that could go to 250 metric tons. Well, the uh, SLS will start at 70 metric tons minimum, the way the 2010 NASA authorization is written, to go to 130 tons minimum. So that could get us up to close to 150 metric tons. You're going to need that. But again, I'll leave you with the idea that uh, if Gemini did to Apollo, going back to the moon, and all the reasons why you should go back to the moon and work out the details, Mars could be trying to go just directly to Mars could be an unmitigated disaster. It is not the way to go. And we have lots of history to prove that over many years. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Well, I'd like to start the discussion kind of on that last, the last points that, uh, that Tom made, uh, that you know, the, it's the prudent thing to do, just like doing Gemini before Apollo would be to go back to the moon before going on to Mars. And indeed, those were the directions that we were going in during the vision for space exploration. And mentioning 1989, I remember that very clearly. What an exciting time. I had uh, I'd been interviewed by NASA, but not yet selected. And here, the president was proposing a moon Mars program and a 24% increase in NASA's budget. Boy, those were, those were looking pretty good. Uh, but, um, you know, of course, the vision for space exploration didn't happen. Uh, then the Constellation program was born, and it also was intended to go to the moon first uh, to learn your lessons before going on to Mars. In 2008, I was part of the White House appointed committee to review U.S. human spaceflight plans. Uh, we were led, of course, by Norm Augustine on, on one of his numerous committees that he's participated in. And the instructions came down from Rahm Emanuel basically saying, don't even talk about the moon, because that was Bush's program. That was W's program, and we're not doing that. 
So that's why you see where we are today. NASA's basically got its hands tied and uh, uh, can't go to the surface of the moon. So what, what we've got today is, a, is kind of an idea that we're going to go do a lot of activities around the moon. Okay, And certainly there are a lot of things to be learned by doing that. Uh, but basically, NASA's kind of been forbidden to land on the moon as of this administration. So, Tom, I want to ask you, how important is it to land? I mean, can we, can we learn lessons? After all, Gemini didn't land on the moon and, or didn't you know, even get close to the moon. No. Can we learn enough lessons around the moon doing all these different operations, or, or is it critical that we land? Uh, Leroy, what I think the answer is no. You need to land. And in this book, we said you design the hardware for Mars for 38% gravity of the Earth, and then you have a margin of safety. You can land on the moon with 16%. And for example, we said we'd weight a suit down with 38% effective weight, so you could walk around on the moon with effectively the same weight, you'd ha the same type of environment you'd have on Mars. And you're going to find all kinds of issues and problems, believe me. Every time you do something new, you're going to find issues and problems. And so I'd say the answer is no. And also, what um, George and I said in here, that it would be an international effort in nature. But again, we did not have the resources to go into how it would be international. We just didn't have the time or the resources to do it. And I think it's wonderful what the European Space Agency and the, the Russian Space Agency is doing and the way they're looking at the moon and because it's a logical thing. You can go there every month, but Mars, you can only go there once every 26 months. And then you have that 15 year synoptic period for low energy or high energy. So really there's only about Effectively, probably eight or nine years you can get there without, with, with, with an effective payload. You could go at the high energy level, but you're not going to get too much payload. Okay, thank you. Lee, let me follow up with you kind of a, along those lines. Uh, you know, you talked a little bit about ISRU, Institute's Research Utilization. Of course, uh, the idea would be to land on the moon and develop those technologies and those techniques and operations. But, you know, there are a lot of people just playing devil's advocate for a moment. There are a lot of people that saying, we don't need to do that. We can test everything in vacuum chambers. We can use uh, lunar analogs here on Earth to do sintering of, of regolith blocks and things like that. And wh what do you think? Is that, is that really possible to do without going to the surface? Or do we need to do that? I think you could certainly do some of the tests, but there really is not a perfect analog for the regolith. I mean, there's, you can model parts of it, but the, you know, the nanophase iron and that sort of thing, uh, you, you just don't have enough to really uh, do it effectively. But I think that the, the, the goal of that is a little bit different, which is that we don't have uh, a big, robust you know, moon capability right now, although we certainly thought when I was watching General Stafford's uh, mission when I was in, in, in grade school, I thought we would be there now. And the reason we're not is because of the rocket equation. And the rocket equation is an unfavorable exponential. By doing ISRU on the surface of the moon and really leveraging what we know about robotics and, and current manufacturing processes, we can get an exponential growth capability and use what Albert Einstein called the most powerful force in the universe, which is uh, compound interest, to undo the limitation of the rocket equation. Uh, and if we can focus on moving the information and not having to m move so much of the matter, uh, you know, I mean, if a, uh, a mold spore floats onto your loaf of bread, it covers the whole uh, loaf. And it, but it, the incoming mass for that operation is, is a minuscule, and so you have a tremendous leveraging. And so the same way, the amounts of mass that we're going to be able to move, even with the largest boosters that we could possibly afford, is going to be limited. And if we have a linear model of, of growing, just everything's got to come from the surface of the Earth, we're never going to get there. But if we can get the, in, in the manufacturing base on the surface of the moon built up, uh, that, I believe, is the critical path. And once you get that manufacturing base, then everything else becomes possible. And that's my view. Okay, thanks, Bonnie. Yeah, I'd like to add to that, because this gets back to what we were talking about, Mike, Tom, and I, uh, about uh, partial gravity. You know, one G, we call a constant. It's ubiquitous. We just, we just put G in the 
the equation, right? Or we ignore it, especially in fluid physics. But when you start going into between zero and one, it's a dominating factor. So in ISRU, it's not just about the regolith and whether you're able to get it to a constant size. Now you've got to worry about heat transport as well and, and the convective flows. And, you know, I started out, truth be told, a uh, ceramic engineer, but my department was mining, metallurgical, and ceramic engineering. So we started with the ores, you know. And G is important. We've ignored it on the earth, but you can't ignore it when you're doing ISRU. And if you have to start introducing liquids or extracting liquids, it changes the whole equation. So it's a not a one-for-one -one translation. You're going to have to do in situ research on the processes on the moon and Mars before you can do ISRU. So we can't ignore G. It's going to impact everything that we do. Okay. Thank you, Bonnie. And, and to stay with you, Bonnie, I mean, you're, you're arguably the most, uh, the, the most um, uh, what's the right word? You're the scientist of the group, let's say. And so, you know, there are a number of reasons to go to the moon that we've talked about. You touched on it in your mar remarks about the science, but that's another reason to go to the surface. Uh, how important is it to go to the surface to do this kind of science? And what kind of science would be uh, the kind that we would try to, to, to really highlight to show the importance of going? Well, I'm going to separate uh, the, the planetary science from the science and engineering that you need to do to build something. Okay, and going back to what Tom was saying, you know, to go to the moon, we had a lot of intermediate stages, and we had to be able to test an environment. We all know that from our technology readiness levels. There's a certain stage that says test an environment before you get to nine, you know, before you actually commit. And even on the shuttle, when I worked on the shuttle, we leveraged everything we did on the shuttle from the X-15 program. It was the success of the X-15 program, and then we had to fill in the gaps on arc jets for materials and hypersonic wind tunnels, and even on Columbia, we instrumented Columbia completely so that we could fill in those gaps on uh, uh, aerothermal heating, for example. So it's very important we understand the environment before we translate or build the technology. So something that we think we will work on the Earth and then translate it to Mars, for example, especially life support systems, which we're still trying to, to uh, perfect in zero gravity, there's no guarantee it's going to work. And if it doesn't work, you don't have many options once you land on the surface of Mars. So there are a lot of, there's much engineering research and modeling that needs to be done in this environment before we go. And I think, in my personal opinion, is that one of the first international efforts that could be done is putting uh, on the surface of the moon uh, a research station where you have this continuous 1-6-G uh, environment, which could be done for both biological, human physiological research, as well as the engineering research. It's important. And I know we can do that. And let me give you an example just following up on Tom. So in 1987, I was asked by the administrator, Dr. Fletcher, to chair a, a special task force looking at whether or not we were ready, the United States, NASA, to populate the International Space Station with research instruments. And the reason I was asked to do that is that I'd been on D1 with my colleagues, Deutschland 1, which was a space lab mission in 1985 with over 100 experiments on it. New furnaces, glove boxes, it was the first protein crystal growth. Uh, we had eight people on that flight, five Americans, uh, two Germans and a Dutchman. And it was a, the first flight of just uh, the German uh, government in flying. And it was separate from the IML space lab flights. And we had not put any instruments, if you will, research instruments in space since Skylab since the early 70s. We had some on the, uh, obviously on the, uh, the Gemini, Mercury, and early Apollo orbital flights because we had to collect human physiology data. We're talking about laboratory equipment. So we pulled together industry and universities and government labs, and we produced a report in uh, 19, late 1987 that said we weren't ready for space station. And Administrator Fletcher took that and said, okay, we need to uh, put together our own U.S. lab flight. We had no U.S. space lab flights in the inventory, in the manifest. They were only German. J1 for Japan and the international IML lab flights for the space lab. So that is the genesis of USML1. And some of those people are Larry Young, for example, remember that. USML1 flew five years later with all new instruments, furnaces built by Teledyne Brown, the, the, brought the sled on board, from genesis of an idea and a report to full funding in flight five years, and I had the opportunity to fly as the payload officer on that 
our payload commander on that flight. So I know you can do it. I know we can do it once we set a destination for it. And I think we need something very similar on the moon on an international basis, just like we do in Antarctica. We need a laboratory there to answer some fundamental questions that have direct relationships to habitats, to life support systems, to even how to handle liquid fuels on the surface of Mars if we want to get back. We need to answer those fundamental questions uh, before we take the next big leap. And in doing so, and setting up that research environment, we will then uh, implement uh, many of the other goals we have for going to the moon. Uh, but we can do that on an international basis. We need to set that goal, I think. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. I'd like to make an observation. I think we've heard from the astronauts and cosmonauts up here today. The devil's in the details. And those details have to be worked out if you want to travel safely. Now, Tom also called me out on talking about the moon as a dead end, when in fact I think we're in violent agreement that it is the proper details that sets the path that gets you to where you want to go. And if you have that plan, you need to work through those things. Now, there can be distractions, and that's what I'm talking about, that you want to avoid the distractions while you lay out the path. And some of those distractions could be related to how you use those resources on the moon and, and where you decide to go. Okay, thank you. I'd like to shift gears just for a moment and go over and start talking a little bit about international cooperation. Tomas, in your remarks, uh, you, you showed the, uh, that the international cooperation in, in was very, pretty much key, I mean, a very important part for many reasons of going to the moon uh, and exploring together with other countries. Uh, I think a lot of us feel the same way, and I've, I've seen Jan Warner, the direct, your director general, uh, give a nice presentation of his, his concept of a lunar village. Uh, makes a lot of sense. Now, the unspoken, or the, the, the white elephant in the room, of course, is China. Right, and I and I mentioned China in my opening remarks that they intend to uh, land astronauts on the moon at some point. In fact, China right now, people may not know, or some people may not know, China has a mission in space right now aboard Tiangong 2, their orbital module. Uh, they've got two astronauts up there. They were going to spend 30 days in space. So they've got a very deliberate, conscious program going. I know Europe is working with China. Uh, I know that at least a few astronauts are learning Mandarin and maybe have started some training in, in Beijing. So do, does Europe plan to cooperate with China uh, for, for lunar exploration, or are there such talks going on? Well, first of all, um, uh, let me say that uh, we are taking this cooperation in a, in a very constant, but, but uh, with, a, with small steps, with a constant pace, but with small steps. Um, since about, I would say, three years, we um, have been intensifying our exchange with uh, Chinese Man Space Agency, CMSA. Um, in the meantime, we have uh, based on a, on a framework agreement that has been signed between our previous director, General Jean-Jacques Dordain, and uh, the head of uh, CMSA. We have established three working groups, um, one of them related to uh, training, astronaut training, the second one to um, microgravity research or space research, and the third one is a little bit the more critical one. It's about infrastructure. Um, we have set um, kind of terms of reference for these uh, three uh, working groups. Um, the um, area of um, exchanging experience on astronaut training is, I would say, at this point, the most, the most advanced. Also in the area of, of uh, uh, doing research, uh, th there has been a good exchange. Chinese scientists took part in uh, announcements of opportunities. Uh, the last one, I think, was in, in uh, 2015 in, in, in April um, on, on uh, medical topics. Now the last one is, is uh, as I already said, is a little bit more critical. Um, there I think uh, we still need to um, tune a little bit uh, the expectations from the both uh, sides. But um, at the end it is um, directed towards um, potential opportunity in the, in the early next decade maybe to have a European flying on a, on a, on a Chinese uh, station. And that is also the reason why some of our uh, young astronauts are are uh, now starting with uh, Chinese language training and, um, and um, are preparing for that. I think at the end it is quite important if we really mean it, and I, I, I very much uh, recall um, the um, 
ISF, uh, that, uh, this forum that we had uh, beginning of 2014 in Washington DC, International Space Exploration Forum led by the European Union, um, hosted by, uh, by the US, where um, I think 32 nations were present and more or less confirmed that um, exploration is an international endeavor. I think it's clear that we need to get as many on board as possible. But of course, this is nothing that just happens uh, with a blink of an eye. It, it takes some preparation. It needs to, um, to be developed. And in that sense, I think the activities we have been starting with, uh, with um, uh, CMSA in those three areas are uh, the right signal on the right track. But once again, it's a constant pace, but it's, you know, it's taking step by step. Uh, maybe a last word to... Uh, the Luna mission so far, there is no um, uh, programmatic uh, cooperation in this field. However, we have uh, been supporting the uh, the last one was Chang'e 3, I think. Mm -hmm. Chang'e 3, we have been supporting um, from ESOC, from our operations center, and there are exchange also to give purely an ops support on, on, on the follow up mission Chang'e 4. Uh, but this is not on a, on a programmatic level, it's just also giving support via the ground stations and, and uh, some, some uh, support in, in, in the operations field. So that's where we are today. But uh, just to, to sum up, I think if we really believe that uh, exploration is really an international endeavor, I think it's inevitable that we need to get as many on board. And by the way, China, apart from the fact there is now this, uh, this uh, mission ongoing, I think very recently they had a successful launch yep. of, of the uh, yeah. Long March 5. Mm -hmm. So this is um, <coughs> also a, an important step forward, which I'm sure we all are following very closely. Great. Thank you. Any other Panel members like to comment on that? Well, I'd like to turn to our, our Russian colleagues, Saljan and, and uh, Oleg. Um, you know, when we were training together in Star City, uh, there were contingents of large groups of Chinese specialists coming through all the time uh, and uh, uh, going and inspecting all the facilities in Star City and, and obviously a big exchange program going on between China and Russia. And I don't think it's a coincidence that uh, a lot of the hardware looks kind of similar, right? So is there still ongoing cooperation between Russia and China? You don't really hear much about it anymore. Um, you've been talking, the Russians have been talking to you Europe about going to the moon together. Uh, is there any, any discussions at all with China in, involved in those discussions? Interesting question, but uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't have a, a very deep cooperation with China now, so especially for moon exploration. Uh, we had a couple of proposals how to continue uh, low Earth orbit flight together and maybe to build a uh, small station together. Uh, I'm talking about post ISS age, uh, but uh, still we're in, uh, in stage of negotiations now. There's only. Okay. Okay. That's yeah. all it. And Saljan, is there any uh, any Russian? I mean, how serious is the Russian program for going to the moon? Do you think is there uh, is there is there any kind of date or any kind of plans to <coughs> milestones for getting to to the moon? Right now, at GCTC, our specialists are already thinking about various trainers and simulators that would be necessary to prepare cosmonauts for the lunar, fl for the lunar flight. Our engineers are drafting technical uh, specifications for these trainers and simulators. Although we do not have the actual vehicles, uh, we do have uh, documentation that's in the development stage right now. So, Mike, I'd like to like to turn to you. You've worked uh, programmatic, um, you know, studies. You've worked with uh, the the White House, the politicians. Um, what what do you think of, of the international cooperation aspect of it? The VSE was pretty much an American an, an American program. Constellation was international, but uh, Mike Griffin very clearly stated that uh, it was all American in the critical path. Uh, we could have our our partners come and contribute, but uh, he saw it as basically an American program. So, do you think this model is something that 
you know, that we should pursue, or do, or do you see it more, uh, more from the European standpoint, where uh, we ought to have, you know, all or many countries in the critical path? I think it's important to have many countries uh, participating. Uh, clearly, in the destinations we're talking about, the kind of resources that are going to be required to expend to, to achieve those goals are beyond the means, I think, of any particular country. Um, we have a, a lot of austerity going on around the world today. So the only way to approach that is to share the, uh, the, the resources that we have available, uh, divvy up the requirements, if you will, and, and pursue those goals. And I think you also heard the details that go into making those plans. One of the important things is going to be to get the engineers to sit down with the policy people to say, here is how to do it. You know, and, and that's been left out, I think, for the last 10 years or so. Uh, policy has come first, and the engineering has come second. And uh, that doesn't always necessarily work out. Right. OK, at this point, I'd like to open it up to the audience. Uh, any questions you have for the panel on lunar exploration or uh, any other aspect of that? Yeah. Walt, uh, I think where microphones are coming. <clears throat> well, I, I may be uh, in a minority, which is not too unusual on some of these questions. <laughs> I thoroughly enjoyed uh, what they had to say out there. Uh, in particular, Tom, on pointing out the significance of the preparation before there's no question the role that Gemini played in getting ready for Apollo. But I also have to say that even after that, when Apollo started flying, the people that I knew there, we talked about this very rarely, but we expected to lose another an Apollo spacecraft before we would uh, successfully land on the moon. What that reflects is an attitude of being willing to face losses. Uh, a major problem we have today is a change in the culture and the attitude that we have. Uh, and we've got to be willing to pay the price when you're pushing back a frontier. You go back and you look at Magellan, you see that only 27 of those people that set out really made it back. Uh, we, the next frontier, of course, was uh, getting out away from the Earth and the Moon, and we had our losses uh, there. To go to Mars, we're going to have to be willing to accept the fact that there are going to be losses. We're going to do the best we can. And the way to do it is exactly as this panel said, is to develop the, those procedures and techniques on the moon. Today, most of what I read about uh, when they talk about going to the moon is really talking about commercializing it, doing this, doing that on, on the moon. I see it as really at best as a tool to develop the techniques to go to Mars. I think it'd be absolutely foolish for us to even talk about going to Mars without including in that that step that says you go to the moon to develop the techniques. And you've got to be willing to accept losses. I would absolutely agree with that. Is you know that is something that a lot of us talk about is that the uh, society as a whole is a lot less, or a lot more risk averse these days, and that certainly transcends itself or, or is, is filtered into the spaceflight program. Uh, you know, I, I know that one of the requirements that really surprised me <clears throat> when we were doing that study is that one of the requirements for Orion is that it had to support six astronauts in their spacesuits, keep them alive for six days in case we had an Apollo 13 type failure on the way to the moon. So so, you know, I, I'm sure that kind of requirement never would have even been discussed during the Apollo days. As you said, I think you guys all expected that you would probably lose at least one vehicle and one crew. Um, so I'm, for the panel, do, do, what, how, do we, how do we reverse that? I, Mike, maybe you have some insights into how do we reverse that attitude in, in space flight in that it's, it's not going to be safe. I mean, we're putting a lot of energy into these vehicles to get them where they need to go. And, and by that very fact, that there is going to be risk. Well, and I think there are a couple of myths that go along with it that we've now built up over time. But uh, coming back to Tom's and my conversation, uh, if you look at a path for going to the moon, uh, in the early Constellation days, we had a requirement for any time return from any landing site. Well, that made the descent stage rather large and uh, the, the ascent stage not much better. Um, but if we had put the order properly and put a habitat down on the surface first that could have served as a safe haven, we could have reduced the requirements on the lander significantly. Mm -hmm. So there are those kinds of engineering decisions that can go into answering those kinds of questions. 
Yeah. Are those there similar concerns in Europe, Tomas? Do you do you feel do you feel similarly burdened in in Europe? Uh, yes, I, I think this uh, this aspect of um, you know how how is uh, public and how is um, let's say the political um, level ready to accept risks is is a, a very uh, important aspect and key to some of the discussions we are having. And I think um, if if I understand your remark right, there is a kind of uh, uh, increasing risk adverseness uh, that that can be perceived. I would like to extend this a little bit um, to the question, you know, what is in an environment where we have um, increasing commercial um, companies coming up and, and like SpaceX, like Blue Origins and other, um, willing to, um, you know, provide transportation and even as we heard in Guadalajara uh, from uh, Elon Musk going to Mars. You know, I wonder that uh, in this uh, context, the role of uh, space agencies, of course, needs to be adapted because it is my understanding, I can say, I can also understanding of ESA, that one of the fundamental roles of an, um, a space agency, institutional organization, is to be at the frontier there, to take the risk which the commercial world is not willing or not capable to take. And um, I think this is even more an, an argument, and I fully agree. I mean, we have to accept risks. Of course, we should do everything to minimize them. But at the end, there is not uh, really a, a point where you can say, now I can be absolutely sure um, to go. And by the way, that remembers me or reminds me very well on this um, discussion when we were um, um, ready to launch on 2006. Um, we, we made a, a first attempt on the 1st of July, then on the 2nd of July, and there was a lightning strike of the external tank in the night from the 2nd to the 3rd of July, and some of the um, insulation of the external tank broke away. And then there was a big discussion, and um, okay, I, I think all of the crew thought, well, until this is solved, uh, you know, we, we can go back to Houston. And, uh, so finally, it could be solved in a, in a, in a short time, and um, I had full confidence that uh, all the specialists who were involved in this decision either to go on the 4th of July or, or to, to postpone the launch, they did all the best, but of course there is a remaining risk and this is what we have to take. And I think the same is true here. There is not an absolute certainty and um, the uh, role of the, uh, of the space agency is really to explain this um, mechanism also to public and to be really on the forefront of taking these risks. Thank you. Tom? <clears throat> One thing, Leroy, I'd like to bring out. Uh, you know, you can, people at times can be a little dumb, but you're not stupid, okay? <laughs> um, our criteria on Apollo was crew survivability from before ignition into insertion orbit of four nines. Now, I don't know how meaningful it is after you get past three nines. <laughs> now, when you leave Earth orbit, that, that's a whole different thing. But when we talk about this commercialization, uh, you know, you have to be sure that, you, that there has to be, to me, both o oversight and insight that whatever you do meets the requirements for that safety for the, for the individual and really for the mission. And they, they can make these statements, but you've got to have documented and, and proper procedures all the way through. Right. I think we're running a little short on time, but I'd like to take at least one more question from the audience. Larry? Uh, Bonnie's point about the importance of having Experience in one sixth G as a way of predicting what's likely to happen in three eighths G is absolutely spot, uh, spot on. There was an NRC panel led by Jack Schmidt a few years ago, which assembled the suggestions of what we would have in a lunar laboratory, a lunar physiology laboratory, in order to be able to start to fill in that gap between zero and one. One G is just a number. We happen to be li to be living with it but we really have s almost no experience other than momentary in the, hyper in the hypo G region. And uh, 
the moon is waiting there for its answer. And by the way, uh, Michael, you, you said AG, artificial gravity, is inevitable, and several of us in this room agree, agree with you. Uh, what do we do to get off the ground? That's a very good question. Um, I think we, we, as a community, need to examine those opportunities for doing some clever engineering. Um, one of the things, I've, I'm on the alumni board at the University of Illinois in the aerospace department, and uh, we sat around the other day, just in October, asking ourselves what kind of classes should students take and how do we keep them from getting these biases that we've built up over time you know minimum mass uh, zero g travel uh, chemical propulsion how do we get beyond those things to get to the new era and uh, the biggest conclusion came up with was get out of their way um, we're too old to give them any good advice anymore go grab the students that are just out f from five years ago let them come back and advise the new millennials so that may be one answer Okay, maybe one more. Anybody got a one more question? No, no, oh, one more. Right here. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, so my question, in, in the spirit of uh, using the moon as a as a test bed for uh, the, the the science, the engineering, and operations for Mars, we talked a lot about gravity, but not really about the communication latency that we're going to inevitably have to deal with on Mars. So um, I guess the question is, do we, you know, we, we've had, I would say, understandable reluctance in using space station, you know, with artificial calm latency. Um, it was never designed to operate that way. If we're going to design, say, our structures and spacesuits and so on to deal with 3 8 gravity, do we need to be designing our other systems and operations for the moon to deal with communication? Loads? Yeah, I don't think you'd get much argument from the crew for less calm. <laughs> Any of the uh, panelists like to comment on, on the importance of uh, simulating latency? Yeah, go ahead, Lee. Yeah, we've, uh, it's a very important topic, and we have done uh, some work, and a number of people have done some work uh, with latency. Uh, we, we did have one where we had a, uh, a crew in a habitat, and I actually was uh, part of that mock crew talking to MCC with varying delays. And after you get past sort of the single digit seconds, it becomes easier to uh, basically text. And there is some value to hearing the human voice in terms of hearing the, the emotion in the tone or the, the uh, you know, so there's, there's that information and there's the wanting to hear, uh, you know, your spouse's voice, so that's part of it. But in terms of the day-to-day -day work, there's texting. And I can tell you that um, in that uh, study, I lean towards using the texting to exercise the technology that the researchers had put before us as opposed to leaning back on the radio. And afterwards, we had a transcript from the team that was all in a room like this, the, the flight control team, but they were communicating with each other with texting. And they had this big transcript of their texts. They weren't talking to each other and they were side by side, but it, it, it went like this. It said, why isn't Morin using the radio? Uh, <laughs> it's because he wasn't a test pilot, <laughs> uh, and, uh, but yet they weren't using, you know, they weren't talking uh, and they were sitting side by side. So we, the world is moving towards texting and that takes care of some of that temporal co-location problem. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. I think we're... Uh, look, oh, go get, ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah just I'll a couple more saying here. Yeah, you know, we have uh, uh, all engineers have uh, kind of roadmaps for critical technologies, uh, not only to reach the moon, but uh, technologies what we need to investigate on the surface of the moon. Because and the qu uh, critical question is how long are we going to stay on the moon? Uh, how long are we going to stay on the moon as a test uh, area f uh, before we fly further to the Mars. And this is a different approach because, you know, it's, uh, for, hu for humans it's very obvious to, okay, just as soon as we technically be ready to fly to Mars, let's do that. Okay, fly there. But a uh, different point of view is, okay, we need to fly to Mars when we be uh, very ready for, uh, for all topics, ready to fly safely. Uh, and returning back from the Mars. Uh, for example, uh, we, we uh, said a couple words about safety uh, and different uh, 
safety aspect flying to the moon. And uh, Russian space agency is thinking about keep uh, flying station around the moon as a, like a, a lifeboat for uh, crews for uh, crews for working on sur surface in the moon, having, for example, multi multi usable landers and have a backup lander on the on the moon station and so it keep let's. Uh, for example, if something happens on the surface, uh, you know, the crew uh, would be able to fly up to the lone station and stay there for quite time uh, uh, when we're in good condition to, uh, f uh, to returning to the Earth. So that's, uh, again, it's a very interesting discussion about the uh, strategy and scenario, how to fly further, how to work together. So that's, that's it, okay, I think. Okay, thank you very much. And thanks everyone, and uh, please please join me in, in thanking the, uh, the panelists again. <laughs>